So before I begin, I want to tell you guys an amazing story that happened to me today. The reason I'm telling you this is because you will appreciate this story. <clears throat> so I usually do my hippo to do it earlier in the day, but Bo Hashem, Hashem had other plans for me, and I didn't get to do it till the afternoon. And I'm at my parents' house in New Jersey, whereas I am usually in my house in, or my apartment in New York. And I have some spots to do Ipo to do it over there. Over here, you know, there's the coronavirus and, um, you know, you're at your parents' house. So then you're regressing to an infant and you have all those things going on at the same time. And then, uh, you know, uh, I tell my parents, I'm going to go to the woods. What are you going into the woods for? You know, I'm going to talk to Hashem, like the whole, the whole story, okay? So now, Buch Hashem, my parents know I do this. It's, it's known. My dad says, oh, you're going to go talk to Hashem now? I say, yes. You know, even that can make me cry just from happiness. because that's, that's a miracle. So anyway, I'm going in the back. I'm in the woods. And I'm um, davening i'm thanking hashem for 10 minutes 20 minutes 30 minutes i'm singing i'm clapping i'm dancing i'm praying for all my students and all my friends hashem help this person with this help this person with this help this person with this and then i said hashem please help me to find a place to be boated that i don't have houses surrounding me on every side and i can mom scream to you and cry to you and no one's gonna hear me and as soon as i said that there's a person who comes down into the woods and he looked very serious. He looked very, very official. I think he was a policeman. And he walks into the woods and he says, Sir, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm talking to God. <laughs> so he said, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, so, um, so here's the thing. I've gotten some phone calls for the past week about a person who's been in the woods every day singing and dancing. And people are very concerned <laughs> about this singing, dancing person in the woods. And uh, he said, you said that you're meditating and you're talking to God. I said, yes. He said, don't you think it's a little bizarre to be dancing and singing in the woods? So I said, uh, no, but I definitely uh, can see why you would feel like that. <laughs> and then he says to me, um, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. And he starts to wave people over, and all of a sudden, all of these police guards are coming into the woods beyond my parents' house. By the way, my parents don't know this. I hope they're not listening to the class right now. So, I, the, 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 the guards are coming in. There's three police guards and one random person all surrounding me in my backyard, in my house. <laughs> and, they're, and they're giving me a full questioning, and the entire time I'm smiling. And, uh, and they're all questioning me, what are you doing here? Why are you in the woods? What, da, 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 da. And then all of a sudden, I go to put my hands in my pockets, and they said, whoa, stop. Don't do that. I said, okay. They said, put your hands on your sides. So I said, okay. They said, what's in your pocket? Because it looked like a big bulging something. So I told them, uh, it's, my, uh, it's my water bottle. <laughs> So they said, can we see that, please? And I see them all getting ready. And I'm slowly taking out my water bottle. And I go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then I see the guy who called the cops because he's with them. And he's seeing very quickly that this is not what he thought it was. <laughs> and what he was probably excited for all week was to get the singing, dancing, crazy guy in the woods. Uh, it was a very innocent, nice guy who was just trying to be happy. And the reason I'm telling you this story is, one, because anybody does Hippo to do it every day is going to have stories like this. So therefore, I thought I, I could share with you guys and share my friends. And I had a chiddush after that. I had a big chiddush because I still have 15 left, minutes left in my Hippo to do it. I'm Baruch Hashem, my wife knows I have to get the hour at least. So she let me go into my basement, into the into the closet to finish. I said, Hashem, thank you that you brought 
a whole host of police officers to come to me and to ask me why I'm uh, acting in a bizarre way in the woods. And I said, Hashem, I hope you show me why I had that happen to me. The first kiddush I had was that was the first time in my life I wasn't scared to be confronted by police cops. Now, my whole life growing up, I was always terrified of the police, especially because of all the stuff that I was doing. However, for the first time in my life, uh, I saw them. I wasn't scared at all. I was actually um, very at peace. And I saw very clearly that Hashem was sending them to me. So Rabbi Nachman says that a person who is not, he doesn't have Yerat Hashem, he doesn't have all of Hashem, he doesn't recognize Hashem as the cause of everything in his life, then automatically Hashem will start to send him people and things and places and situations to be scared of, to remind him that he doesn't have to be scared of those things, that he needs to redirect it back to Hashem. That was one thing I thought about. But Bo Hashem was first time. By the way, if you guys don't know, there's an amazing story in the Baal Tanya, the creator of Chabad, Hasidus. So there's a story where he was in jail and the Russians were beating him and they were um, like terrorizing him in the cell. He wouldn't say anything. And all of a sudden, one of them came over with a gigantic gun and he placed it at his head. And he said to him, where's your God now? And he looked at him without any reaction, no response, no inner turmoil, no nothing. He smiled at him and he told him, you're more scared of that gun than I am. And the guy f just froze and his body started to go into an epileptic fit. <laughs> the gun flew out of his hand and that was it. So you hear stories about like this and that, that sounds crazy. But the truth is that if you live with Hashem and you talk to Hashem every day, you realize everything's Hashem. There really is nothing to be afraid of. Not at all. Okay? That's one. Two, which is the bigger Kiddush. This guy thought it was so weird that someone was so happy and dancing and singing outside. That is so bizarre. That is crazy. I've had students who tell me before, David, you know, I know that this is connected to you. I know that you feel like this has saved your life. I know you really believe in it. But do you ever feel like you're losing your mind? So I tell them, I already lost my mind a long time ago, growing up in secular society. That was the greatest mind wasting that I ever had in my life and caused me tremendous sadness. And I'm finding my mind now. But you know what's incredible? These people probably only experience real happiness when they have their friends over and they get drunk. That they wait all week, they work all day and night miserably so that they could have their weekend off, so they could have their friends over, so they can get drunk when nobody's saying it, so they can finally be happy. And they work all week to experience that for two hours plus a hangover in the morning. I know what that's like. But if you think about it, how bizarre is it that the world feels that this is the only normal way to be happy? And that a person who's happy without drugs, that he's singing and dancing as if he was drunk when he's not drunk because he's got that same level of simcha and that same level of not being afraid of anything without becoming inebriated. And that's bizarre. That is the most bizarre thing. The Zohar said that this world is Alma de Shikra. It is a world of lies. The whole world is a world of lies. And that a person, a nice, simple Yid who goes into the woods and is singing and he's clapping and he's happy, and this person is a threat to society. <laughs> Yet everyone else doesn't feel that their sadness is a threat to society. 
They don't feel like their anger is a threat to society. They don't feel that their alcoholic tendencies and addiction to drugs is a threat to society. No, this is normal. What you're doing is bizarre. So the reason I'm telling you all of this is because you need to know that you can either, according to society, be normal or you can be happy and you do not have a choice. That's your choice. That doesn't mean you can't be a normal, you can be normal. When you're happy, you're gonna be normal. But you can't be normal according to society standards because they're not happy. And if you want to be normal according to society, you have to be miserable. Rabbi Nachman says every single Jew needs to have holy chutzpah. What does that mean? It means you need to be bold for the truth. And you can't sway to the right or left for lies. This whole world is a very narrow bridge. There's nothing to be afraid of, okay? Please, I beg of each of you, don't be afraid to be happy. Don't be afraid to believe in Hashem. Don't be afraid to pray in the woods. Don't be afraid to sing and dance. Because I promise you, that 99.99999% of the world's population would love to feel that happy all the time. But they're too afraid to, and they don't know how to. Rabbi Nachman teaches you how to. Your choice only now is, do I want to be normal according to society, or do I want to be happy? And you can't learn these classes and then go to your therapist and say, I don't know why I'm not happy. Because I've seen a thousand therapists and I had that same conversation. And you know the reason why I wasn't happy? You know the reason why nobody's happy? Because you're afraid to be happy. Because you're afraid to be you. Because you're afraid to be normal. Don't be afraid anymore. And when you do, and you are happy, and then you're finally normal, you'll realize that Hashem has always been with you. That the reason you didn't feel Him before is because you weren't happy. It says that the prophets could not experience Navua. This is according to Halakha. You cannot be a prophet. You can't experience deep hasagas, deep revelations of godliness, if you were not besimcha, you weren't happy. This is not a Breslov concept. It is a Torah concept. You want to experience Hashem in your life? You need to be besimcha. You need to be happy. The word Mashiach, the one who's coming to save us, his, his name, if you flip the, the letters around, it's Yismach. It means he makes happy. <laughs> It almost sounds like a little kid. He makes me happy. But he's really going to make us all happy. That's his whole mission in this world, is to make us happy. But we know that Mashiach is here to teach the truth. So I don't understand. I want to be happy. He's teaching me the truth. So how is that making me happy? So the answer is because you cannot have the truth and not be happy. And if you're not happy, it means you're not holding by the truth. Because Rabbi Nachman teaches that the truth makes a person happy. And if you're sad, it's because you're invested in a lie. Psychologically, emotionally, physically, spiritually, you are cogitating, you are meditating, you are investing yourself in a sheker, a lie. So tonight we're going to learn about Mashiach. Are you ready? Good.
We've learned so far that the weapon of Mashiach is tefillah, is prayer. And by the way, when he asked me if I weapon, if I had a weapon, I did want to tell him I had one. <laughs> My mouth. And I was slaying the klipot out there. Mamish. <laughs> In fact, Ravavadi Yosef, who was not on paper a breast lover chassid, but he was the posekador. And he is the, one of the greatest tzaddikim of our generation. And he never left Eretz Yisrael because there's a whole complication that if you live in the land of Israel, it's a problem to leave, okay? So he rarely ever left. However, his yeshiva needed money and he needed to support it. And the people around him were telling him, this you need to do. You need to go outside of Israel to help collect because you need to teach people Torah. So he finally got up. He got to the airport. And he never went to the airport. <laughs> and they asked him when he got up to get uh, into the plane, they said to him, do you have any weapons on you? So he smiled and he said, yes, my tongue. <laughs> but he was telling the truth. <laughs> the Torah teaches the Jew's weapon is in his mouth. And the weapon of Mashiach, and the weapon of Mashiach within you is your mouth. But how do you unlock that weapon? How is it not only a potential? You have to have attained a level of sexual purity. You had to have attained the level of uh, not engaging in physical excess, which is very hard to do. What's the key to getting to that place? So we said, you need something called mishpat, justice. Mishpat. But how do you get this thing called justice so that you can be smeared with the bridge so you can get your prayers answered? The answer is only by giving tzedakah. Because tzedakah is the greatest act of justice. And by doing that, you have this quality of justice. Now, why is justice so important for you? Because what's getting in the way of your prayers getting answered is that you're having distracting thoughts. So Rav Nachman says, how do you get rid of your distracting thoughts? You need to have justice because your eyes are called justice. However, when your justice is not with you, then your eyes are blemished. And then you have distracting thoughts when you pray and also throughout the day. But it's most important when you pray because your thoughts that are distracting you are getting in the way of you getting your prayers answered. And the images that are popping in your head are getting in the way of getting your prayers answered. So how do you get rid of it? By giving tzedakah. This is what we said so far. Now, Rav Nachman says like this, And every person, besides the fact or in addition to, or in conjunction with the fact that you're giving tzedakah before you pray, you also need to machavin, you need to intend in your tefillah. That you are attaching yourself to the tzedikim of the generation. To the real tzedikim of the generation. Okay, so let's take a second and go back. This is the beginning of what's going to be a long, long journey of what's called the Veku with the Tzadik. To be Davik to the Tzadik, to be attached to the Tzadik. Okay. Anyone who has not learned Rabbi Nachman's teachings before, anyone who grew up secular, anyone who grew up religious and not connected to the teachings, the Baal Shem Tov is very weary of what we're about to say. However, I want you to see very clearly that this is pshat, that this is not a Hasidic concept, that this is brought down by Chazal and by Rashi. And we're going to see what that means in a second. What is that? You have a mitzvah deoraita. You have a mitzvah from the Torah. That means that you have to do it. It doesn't just mean it's a good thing to do. It means you have to. That you have to have the vacant with Hashem. You need to have attachment to Hashem, cleaving to Hashem. So Rashi, 
who is the most famous commentator on the Torah, and he's only looking to explain what is the simple understanding of this. Not what is the Kabbalistic understanding, not is what is the exposition of this, not what is the hint. What does it mean simply? How do I fulfill that mitzvah? So Rashi has a question on this simple understanding, and that is, Hashem is not physical. How can the Torah command every single Jewish person, man or woman, to have attachment with something that's not physical? So Rashi says there explicitly, and he brings a Midrash that says the same exact thing, I believe, in the Sifri. That the only way to have attachment with Hashem is to have attachment with Tzaddikim and Talmidei Chachamim. And by having attachment with real tzaddikim, you fulfill the mitzvah of being attached to Hashem. So you see very clearly here that if anybody in the world wants to fulfill the mitzvah of devekut with Hashem, they need to have attachment to a tzaddik. So already, you must understand this is not a chiddush of the Baal Shem Tov. This is Chazal. Good. Now the question is, how do you be attached to a tzaddik? Okay, great. So we say, according to Rashi, everyone understands, you need to have attachment to tzaddikim because the only way to have the vehicle with Hashem, and many people say, especially the Baal Shem Tov, that the vehicle with Hashem is the mitzvah of the entire Torah, and all the mitzvot are included within that mitzvah. So according to the Baal Shem Tov Kodesh, the greatest Hasidic master who ever lived, the originator of Hasidus, he says that the mitzvah in the Torah is the Vekut Hashem. And Rashi says the only way to have the Vekut with Hashem, according to Chazal, is to have attachment to real tzaddikim. So now the Gemara needs to say, if that's the case, so how do you attach to a tzaddik? So the answer they give in the Gemara, I believe it's in Ketuvot, it's by giving him tzedakah. So the only way to be attached to Hashem and to fulfill the most important mitzvah in the Torah according to the Baal Shem Tov is to give tzedakah to a tzaddik. The Gemara has another answer, though, which is the essence of why you're giving tzedakah, which we're going to learn later on. Why is tzedakah the key to me being attached to a tzaddik, which is allowing me to be attached to Hashem? The answer is like this. Rav Nachman explains elsewhere in Likut Maran, money comes from the same place as the root of your soul. And therefore, when you give someone or something your money, you're literally giving them a piece of your neshama. And when a true tzaddik has that piece of you, it becomes much easier for him to help you rectify, to help you mend, to help you heal, because your soul now becomes encompassed in his soul by giving him money. Okay. So if that's the case, what if I don't have money to give for tzedakah? Many Jews simply do not have enough money to still support their family and give tzedakah. Bezrat Hashem, hopefully you do, and you have a mitzvah deraita to give tzedakah. And Chazal hold, at the very least, it's 10%, and the Shulchan Aruch says at the most, it's 20%. Okay? So if you're able to, so you have to give from 10 to 20%. Let's say you're not able to. And many breast lover chassidim were poor. So how did they give tzedakah to Rabbi Nachman? How did they give tzedakah to the tzaddik? So the Gemara gives another answer. By serving him. By letting him use your physical means. Meaning you don't have money, you allow him to use something else. You allow him to use your home. You give him food. You give him a ride. You 
put on his shoes. All of these things on a simple level are you're serving him physically. What's the connection between that and giving money? These seem like two completely separate things. But the answer is, what Rabbi Nachman is saying, it's the same exact thing. Because Rabbi Nachman says elsewhere that your possessions are connected to your soul, just like your money. So when you give your tzaddik, your possessions, so then in fact, it's like giving tzedakah. Because you're now becoming encompassed within his soul. Okay, good. Let's say you don't have any possessions to give. So how do you give tzedakah to the tzaddik? So Rav Nachman is going to say elsewhere. And Rav Nathan says as well that this isn't just if you don't have money, but this is even if you have money. How do you have the baker with the tzaddik? Rav Nathan says, by learning his chokhmah, by learning his wisdom constantly, and by doing his ratzon. Meaning, you have a true tzaddik. You want to be attached to him. Rav Natan says, what's the essence of attachment to a true tzaddik? That you learn his wisdom constantly in order to do it in your life. And by doing it in your life, you are attached to him. And if you do that, that means you have the vacuum with Hashem. And now everybody wants to know, how can I ever get to the point that I am completely smeared the Brit, that I don't really see it anymore, that I don't see things I'm not supposed to see anymore, that I can pray and get all my prayers answered, that I have this quality of justice so I don't have any distracting thoughts in my mind. This is insane. How could I ever be able to do all of those things? I'm just a person. Rabbi Nachman says every single Jew can do these things. But what is the key? You need to have the vacuum with Hashem. And how do you have the vacuum with Hashem? How do you have attachment with Hashem? You need to have attachment to a real tzaddik. And how do you have attachment to a real tzaddik? You need to learn his wisdom and do his ratzon. Follow his etza, his, his advice. And if you do that every day, no matter what's going on in your life, then you will achieve all of these things. So actually, this whole Torah is very simple. You want to unlock your mouth and get all your prayers answered and not have any distracting thoughts? You need to learn Rebbein's every day in order to do it. And when push comes to shove, no matter what's happening in your life, you do it. You had a bad day, you do it anyway. You had a great day, you do it anyway. You feel bad, you do it anyway. You feel happy, you do it anyway. Because when you attach yourself to a tzaddik like this, you break all of the klipot. And you are able to obtain all the things that Rabbeinu wanted for you. Rav Natan, I mean, sorry, Rav Nachman had many, many, many Tamidei Chachamima students, geniuses in Torah, people who knew Shas by heart, People have been through it many, many, many times. People who have been through the entire Shulchan Aruch. People who knew all Sifrei Kabbalah. They knew all the books of Kabbalah. They knew all of the Torah. However, none of them reached the same level as Rav Natan. Why? Rav Natan was not as smart as them. He was not as charismatic as them. He was not as wise as them. He wasn't as energetic as them. He didn't believe in himself as much as they did. He actually didn't believe in himself at all. So how did Rav Natan achieve every single thing that Rabbi Nachman spoke about? To be able to then give it over to the whole world that we're only here now because of Rav Natan. The answer is very simple. Rav, Na Rav Natan, when he saw Rav Nachman, and he experienced what he was saying. And he saw Rabbi Nachman in front of him. 
He said to himself like this, Rabbi Nachman has everything. His wisdom has everything. His advice has everything. So he said, I will only be able to also have everything when I have nothing. That means that I am going to throw my mind on the side. I am going to throw my limited intellect, which has caused me to feel like this, on the side. And I'm going to listen to Rabbi Nachman's lessons and Torah and read it and learn it every day till it's implanted in my heart. And I am going to follow his wisdom and his etza, his advice, no matter what's going on in my life. And if anybody wants to see what this looks like, read through fire and water. And also, if you want to see what this looks like, read Rev Natan's letters. And you'll see what that looks like. That means he's in jail and he never stops learning. That means that his wife passes away and he goes to Uman for Rosh Hashanah. That means that even though people are trying to kill him, he is learning Shulchan Aruch every day, like Rabbi Nachman told him to. So while this might sound overwhelming, this is the most empowering thing in the world. Because what we're learning now is it doesn't matter at all what your koach is, whether you're smart or you're not smart, whether you're charismatic or you're not charismatic, whether you are good with your mouth or you're not good with your mouth. Whether you are savvy in business or you're not. Whether you're married or you're not. Whether you have kids or you don't. That if you simply nullify your limited mind to the unlimited mind and consciousness of the Tzadik Yisod Olam, and that doesn't just mean learning his wisdom, but doing what he's teaching you physically doing it, then you can achieve anything. That's called attachment to a tzaddik. And when you do that, you will become shmirat brit. And when you become shmirat brit, you will get all your prayers answered. Very simple. Why is that? Because Rav Nachman now teaches that the tzaddik of the generation, who bechinat Moshe Mashiach, he is Moshe Rabbeinu to you. You have a true tzaddik. You have someone you feel has everything. That you see that his followers also are happy. You see his followers have a muna. You see his followers have shalom bayit. You see his followers who are really mamish osek in it. They are connected to it. They have coal. And you feel that it's in there. Do you know why? Because to you, he is Moshe Rabbeinu. And if you said to yourself, when you read the Torah, how could the Jews not listen to Moshe? That they're in the desert. He takes them out of Egypt. He takes them out of slavery after 200 years. He shows them miracles. He gives them everything. And they're all not listening to Moshe. And you say to yourself, how is that possible? And the answer is, look in the mirror and you'll know. Because we do the same thing every day. The issue is not that we don't have the tzaddik. The issue is not that we don't have the ability. The issue is we don't believe in him. Rav Nachman says that there are four levels of trust. And if you are lacking in any of them, you don't have any of them. You have to have 100% trust in Hashem Yiparach. You need to believe in him 100%. You need to have trust and belief 100% in his Torah. That even if you don't understand it, you still believe that it's true. You need to have 100% belief and trust in a true tzaddik. In true tzaddikim. 
Not any less than your trust in Hashem. The same trust. The same belief. And lastly, you need to have 100% trust and belief in yourself. And Rav Nachman says, if you don't have these, you don't have a Muna. Because you can't. And that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It means you're normal, you're human, you're a person like all of us. But you now have something to work towards. And your ability to achieve all of those things is the vacant with the tzaddik. No matter what anybody tells you, no matter how many people scoff at you for learning Breslov, no matter how many people laugh at you and call cops on you because you're dancing and singing in the woods, I'm telling you right now, If you have real attachment with the Rebbe, if you have real attachment with the real Tzaddik, you will achieve everything you want in your life. But that means you have to believe in him. And if you don't believe in him, like I didn't for many years, then in your Hibodadut, you need to say to Hashem, Hashem, please help me to believe 100% in my Tzaddik. Help me to believe 100% in your Torah. Help me to believe 100% in you. Help me to believe in myself, please. For the love of God, help me to believe in myself. And Hashem will answer you. But the way that you show that you believe in something, in truth, is by doing their Ratzon. So if you really believe in Hashem, you do his ratzon. It says clearly in the Balatanya. The Tanya says that if a Jew doesn't do one of the 613 mitzvot, not saying anything bad about him, nothing. But as a matter of fact, this person has a begam in amuna. Because there's no way you can believe completely in Hashem and not do the mitzvot. Because Hashem, if you believe in him, he's telling you this is good for you. So how are you not going to do the thing he, he says is good for you? Because you don't believe in him. Or you don't believe he's good. Or you don't believe he knows better than you. Same thing with the tzaddik. You want to get the most out of learning Rabbi Nachman's teachings? You have to do it. You can't just learn it. But when you do it, no matter what's happening in your life, that's called the vacuum with the tzaddik. And then you mamish get everything. Why? Because the tzaddik, Rab Nachman says, is the concept of Moshe Rabbeinu, the Mashiach. How do we know that Moshe and Mashiach are connected? So, there is a very famous pasuk at the end of Sefer Bereshit, where Yaakov is blessing his children. And we know according to Chazal, according to the Midrashim, according to Rashi, according to everyone, this was all Mavua about the days of Mashiach, about the future, about everything that would happen from then until the end of time was included in those blessings that Yaakov gave to his children. And when Yaakov went to bless Yehuda. He said to him, kingship is going to come from you. Meaning, the Mashiach is going to come from you. Who is that, Rashi says? David. Kingship is going to come from you. He's talking about David in the future. Okay, great. And then he says that kingship, and he's hinting to this Yaakov, to Yehuda, is going to rise and fall constantly. Sometimes they're going to have it, sometimes they're not going to have it. Sometimes they're going to have it, sometimes they're not going to have it. However, this is only Ad Ki Yavo Shiloh, until Shiloh comes. So Shiloh never appeared in the Torah until now, and he doesn't appear later on in the Chumash either. So what's Shiloh? What's going to happen when Shiloh comes, that all of a sudden... Kingship is now forever. Jewish kingship is in place and we're no longer going to be uh, in servitude to the non-Jewish governments of the world and to the Klippot. And the answer is only when Shiloh comes. So Rashi right away says, who is Shiloh? 
And Rashi brings the Midrash in Rashid Rabbah that says, Hu Melech HaMashiach, that Shiloh is Mashiach. Meaning when Mashiach comes, then kingship, Jewish kingship will be established forever. And we will have Jewish sovereignty. And we will not have to be servants or slaves or work anymore for the secular world. We will be free when Shiloh comes. Okay, great. Where does the Midrash know that from? So, first off, the Gemara says, one of the names of the Mashiach, there's four names that they give in the Gemara. One of them is Shiloh. Okay, so there's one answer. Let's get another answer. Because the Zohar says very clearly, how did Rashi know that Shiloh is referring to Mashiach? How does the Midrash know that Shiloh is talking about Mashiach? Because Shiloh is Gematria 345. Who else is at the Gematria? Moshe. But Moshe passed away. He didn't even bring us into the land. So how could it be that Yaakov is telling Yehuda that only when Moshe comes are we going to have redemption? And the answer is unbelievable. That the Arizal teaches that Moshe Rabbeinu comes back in every single generation. That the soul of Moshe comes in every generation and he fulfills the role of Mashiach in that generation. And if you follow him, then you are not under the sovereignty of the secular world. Not the work world, not the emotional handicapped world, not the psychologically destitute world, not the land of unhappiness. If you have anointed Shiloh as your king, that means you do his ratzo. That is the Moshe of the generation. So now let's look at it, because it's very interesting. If Moshe comes in every generation, specifically the Rizal says every jubilee, his soul comes back down. So it's every 50 years. How many 50 years have there been since the beginning of creation? How many jubilees have there been since day one? So we're in the year 5780. Bezrat Hashem will all be in Uma and Rosh Hashanah for Rosh Hashanah in 5781. How many jubilees have there been? How many jubilees will there be by the year 6,000? The answer is 120. Does anybody know how long Moshe Rabbeinu lived? 120 years. The Rizal says, you know why it says he lived 120 years? Because his neshama comes back down to this world 120 times to be the Mashiach of that generation. And the Rizal goes down and he brings many reincarnations of Moshe starting from even before Adama Rishon. He was already there. And then he came down as Shait. And he eventually became Shame. And he was also Avel, Abel. And he was also Noah. And he was also Achia Hashiloni. The one who taught the Baal Shem Tov all of his Torah. And he was also Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And he was also Rabbi Nachman of Breslau. Even more than that, which they don't say here. Who is after Rabbi Nachman? We're going to see. <laughs> However, we do know that Rabbi Nachman says his fire is going to burn until Mashiach comes. So therefore, until we see the Mashiach and he fulfills everything that the Shulchan Aruch, or let's say the code of the Rambam says that he has to fulfill in order to be Mashiach, so until then, the fire of Rabbeinu will burn. And that fire is going to bring us there. So now... If you look at that pasuk as well, it says, 
Ki ah, ah, sorry, Ad ki yavo Shilo, until Shilo comes. So Shilo is Gematria 345, which is the Gematria of Moshe, who we know according to Kabbalah, his soul is going to reincarnate for the final time as Mashiach. And he's going to be the, in the body of David. That on the outside, he's going to look like David. He's going to sound like David. He's going to have the same ability to speak like David. But what's inside of him is actually the soul of Moshe, Mashiach. Ad ki yavo shilo. Yavo shilo is Gematria 358. What is that the Gematria of? Mashiach. So within these two words, you have references to Moshe, Mashiach, the final king. All of this is simply to say that the tzaddik of the generation, that the true tzaddik, the tzaddik emet, is Mashiach. So your only issue is whether or not you attach yourself to him or not. If you do, you'll find redemption, just like the Jews did in Mitzrayim. And if you don't, you get left in the desert. How do we know, though, that Moshe is in every generation on a simple level? So Rav Nachman says very clearly, it says in the Gemara, that for all the generations, that the Talmidei Chachamim, the Tzaddikim, when they used to talk to each other in Torah, and one of them said good. He said something that was emet, that was true. He used to say, Moshe Shapir Kamart. Moshe, you said good. Even if his name wasn't Moshe. Why? Because if you're saying the truth, it means you are embodying the Mashiach. You're embodying Moshe. Moshe Zebechiat Mashiach. And Moshe is the Mashiach. And the Zohar says, Da Moshe Mashiach, that Moshe is Mashiach. Okay, great. Now, we will continue this tomorrow and find out how this has to do with you getting your prayers answered. But just for tonight's class, does anybody have any questions? By the way, if you want to attach yourself to Hashem, you have to attach yourself to the tzaddik. And you attach yourself to the tzaddik by learning his wisdom, which you all just did. Okay, you're halfway there. Now you have to do what he's teaching you. So now your obligation is to ask, what do I do now with this tomorrow until we meet again Thursday night? Shoot. Don't be shy. No questions. Is everything hunky-dory in your lives? Questions means klipas. We don't have questions because we got rid of the klipas. We know what's up. Oh, Hashem. Hashem. Okay, good. That was clear? Nobody, has a, nobody wants to say I'm a heretic or something? Crystal clear. The tzaddik. Was that how your hands went up with the cops this morning? <laughs> I didn't at all. I didn't even flinch. I'm more scared of you guys than I was of the cops. Um, <laughs> and they're more afraid of their guns than you were. <laughs> <laughs> it was epic. I wish you guys could have been there. And I told my wife after. She's like, I was mommish there. You don't even know. She's like, David, this stuff only happens to you. I was like, actually, this stuff happens to Benny every day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and the truth is, anybody who does Ipoh to do it every day, he's also going to have the stuff happen to him. Okay. So, really no questions, not at all? Nothing? Okay, so I'm going to give you a piece of eight. So you ready? We're going to meet Thursday night. And we're going to find out how this attachment to the Tzaddik, to Moshe, to Mashiach, is what allows you to unlock your weapon of tefillah. What is it exactly that he's doing with their prayers that's allowing them to get answered, okay? Now, until then, I highly suggest that if you have not started doing Hippodadut every day, that you do Hippodadut. Because Rabbi Nachman says 
that the highest, greatest thing a Jewish person can do is to talk to Hashem for at least one hour a day. It's higher than learning Torah. It's higher than praying with a minyan. It is higher than putting on tefillin. He says it is the highest avoda that you have. It doesn't mean you don't have to do those other things. You do. But if you want to see the fruit of Rebbe Nachman in Breslev, if you want to experience the Vekut with Hashem, that you get all the blessings that we've been speaking about for years that Rebbe Nachman says you can have, the way you do that is by attaching yourself to Him. And how do you attach yourself to Him? By following His Eitzah. So if you have not yet started to do one hour of Hibodadut, tomorrow or tonight, go do it. Do it. And even if you don't speak, it's also good. Because Hibodadut doesn't mean to talk, it means to be alone. It means to be alone with Hashem. Okay? And even if it doesn't make sense to you how that's good for you, that's perfect. Because when there is a real tzaddik who's giving you advice, if it all made sense to you, it would mean that you're him. And if you were him, you wouldn't need his help to be close to Hashem. So if it doesn't make sense to you, the things that Rabbi Nachman tells you are good for you, that's a good sign. Okay? Rabbi. Yes. Um, you said that after 45 minutes, you got interrupted and then you finished the 15 minutes in the story. So basically, based on what you said, you're allowed to kind of, if you distract yourself, like 30 minutes you dive and all of a sudden you need to take a break or you have to use the bathroom or something like that, you're allowed to take that and come back into it? Yeah, there's no, it's part of being a breast lover chassid, part of learning Rabbi Nachman's Torah is to leave OCD behind. And I know it's very hard for Jewish people to do that, me first and foremost. But Hibodadut is not stressful, okay? You have to go to the bathroom in the middle of your Hibodadut, you should. <laughs> and go back and continue. If you, if, if you have the hour, you have the hour, you know? Uh, if something comes up, that doesn't mean you put yourself in a position to. That doesn't mean you keep your phone on ring because it's going to keep ringing because this is this world nowadays. But if you do everything you can not to be interrupted, and you get interrupted, it's fine. Hashem wanted it. So you just take a break, you go to the bathroom, you come back. I do it every day. It's totally fine. There's a you question. Me? It's okay. Thank you. There's a question in the chat. Yes. Let me see. There's a Please chat question. Oh, great question. When will we be able to actually learn with you in person and not through a screen? As soon as in your Hibodadut, you all pray for it, we will do it. How's that sound? Or we can all go, <laughs> <laughs> we can all go to the designated area and learn. Yes. However, that will only happen when you all pray for it. Believe me. So, therefore, uh, when will it happen? I think according to phase one of New York, something, 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 people are allowed to start to be together in the same room. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, it's shtus. Yes, I know, but is there a, is there like a solid understanding what that means exactly? I think there's four phases and it's connected to four exiles. I got it. <laughs> what, what is the first phase? How many people are allowed in one room together? That's what I'm asking. Anybody know? Okay, good. It must mean you guys are staying. If I'm not mistaken, Rabbi, it's 10 people. 10 people? 10 people. I believe so. Okay. So, Bezrat Hashem, if you guys pray Minya. for it, we will all be together in the designated area. First 10 to arrive. Um, <laughs> we kick everyone else out. <laughs> in, in the Tzion Breslov Center, okay? But that means you're going to have to pray for it because I'm telling you right now, I'm promising that Satan does not want us to go to that place and learn together. So, therefore... If you want to get there, you are going to have to dive in every day, me included, okay? Because I'm telling you, it's a crazy thing. Every Breslov rabbi who goes around the world will tell you that when they come to, to speak over a Torah, 
They have issues getting there. They have issues staying there. They have mechanical issues. They have audio issues. They have every issue under the sun. What's the reason? Because Satan does not want anybody teaching Rabbi Nachman's Torah to anybody. And if we are all going to be together, mamish, Osek in the Torah of Rabbi Nachman and Fega, we are all going to have to pray tremendously to get there. Okay? That's a good thing to pray for in your hippo to do. Any last questions? Okay. Uh, yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I understand what you're saying about connecting yourself to a tzaddik, but if Hashem, I'm, I'm not questioning it. I'm definitely doing it, but just had that in my mind. Um, if Hashem is our father, and just like a father listens to his son, he doesn't need. Um, another, a second or a third, second person or third person to kind of um, translate or, or to, to, to go on, the, on his behalf. If a child comes to his father, no matter what, where he is, at what level, he's always going to listen to him. So is it why, I mean, we're connecting him, we're, we're using the rabbi to a topic to connect to him and this generation, Rabbi Nachman. So what is there, uh, what's, what's the connection? Why, we, why can't we just talk to Hashem and say, listen, you're our father, answer us. There's a great question. Great question. This is the question that everybody has, okay? The answer is like this. First, simply, again, according to Rashi, you cannot be attached to Hashem without a tzaddik, okay? Why? Because Hashem is not physical. So the simple understanding is, how do you ever learn Torah? So you can answer that question. You ready? Where are you learning Torah from? Where? From, from the books. Okay. Who wrote those books? Uh, rabbis. Oh, okay. And these rabbis that you're reading those books, let's say you didn't have those books. Where would you get your Torah from? Based on rabbi, I mean, everybody, I'm a Gemara, a machine, I mean, everything's written by the rabbis, so... Uh, oh, right, so they're all written by the rabbis. So let's say you didn't have yeah. that. How would you get close to Hashem? You have to have a, a source that uh, that now comes from. Okay, good. And the source... There you go. Okay, <laughs> okay so therefore, the, the answer is very, very simple. There is a concept that's called make yourself a rabbi. It's in pure kevot. This is not a chiddush of chassidut. That every Jew is incumbent upon him to have a rabbi. Why do you need a rabbi? Why don't you just go connect to Hashem? Because very simply, they know how to be close to Hashem and you don't know yet. So that's a simple understanding. By learning from the person who knows more than you how to be close to Hashem, you find out how to be close to Hashem. Now, on a deeper level, not a secret level, but just a deeper level. The answer is like this. Rav Natan explains, and Rav Nachman explains, what is so important about having a tzaddik? What's the main point of attaching to a tzaddik? Why don't you just go talk to Hashem and figure it out on your own? The answer is very simple. Because we're not humble. And the whole reason we're not close to Hashem and we're all struggling is because none of us are humble. And the easiest way to humble yourself is to listen to someone who knows more than you. That is the easiest, quickest, surest way to become humble. And if it doesn't make sense what they're saying to you, and you have to do it anyway, this brings you to the greatest level of humility. And the whole key to being close to Hashem is called anava, humility. The reason why Moshe Rabbeinu was closer to Hashem and experienced Him in a greater way than anyone who ever lived is because He was the most humble man who ever lived. That means the key to being close to Hashem is to being humble. So why aren't we feeling close to Hashem? Because we're not humble. And if you think you're humble, but you're not feeling close to Hashem, it's because you're not really humble. So how can you attain humility? Through a tzaddik. Because if you have someone who is telling you this is how you get close to Hashem, and this is good for you. Automatically, when you listen to Him, you're humbled. And more so even, when you follow His advice, you're humbled even more. 
And let's say you follow his advice, even though it goes contradictory to what your thinking makes sense, then you will attain true humility. And then you're going to be very close to Hashem. So these are all simpler answers. There's more Kabbalistic answers than that, but does that answer on a very simple level? Absolutely, it, it does actually. Uh, before I even got into listening to your lectures, I was actually praying before. Uh, I want to get uh, a rabbi that I'm connected to it so I can get as much knowledge as I can to change myself. For many months I used to pray this. So now Hashem answered my prayers and I have a great time that I'm learning from. Oh Hashem, can I tell you something? And I want to tell everybody here, everyone who's listening to me, listen very carefully. Ravi Nachman says clearly in the Kutta Maran, the most important thing a Jewish person can do in his whole entire life, more than getting married, more than having kids, more than anything, Rav Nachman says the greatest thing a Jewish person can do for himself in his life is to attach himself to a real tzaddik. Why? Because when you do, then you get everything. You're going to get everything. Why? Because when you're close to Hashem, you have everything because Hashem is everything. But how do you be close to Hashem? By being close to a real tzaddik. So what can be more important than that? And also, you know, this is a, obviously a very big source of... Uh, Machlokit and controversy is that Rabbi Nachman says that if you're learning from a tzaddik who's not a real tzaddik, then all of the Torah he's going to be giving you is going to also have within it lies. It doesn't mean that person's a bad person. That person could be a great person. It doesn't mean that person has bad intentions. He could have the best intentions. It means that everything that he teaches you is going to have within it something that actually brings you further away from Hashem, not closer to Hashem. And you're going to say, yeah, but there's so many tzaddikim, how are you going to say that, X, Y, and Z? And the answer is very clear. Look in the Torah. Who took the Jewish people out of Mitzrayim? It was Moshe. Now, if you didn't want to leave through Moshe, did you leave Egypt? No. Nobody can get up and say, yeah, but, but, but this guy, his name is uh, Simon. So Simon also knows a lot. Yeah, but Simon's not Moshe. And for you to leave Mitzrayim, so you need Moshe. You need Moshe. And by the way, you should know what allows Moshe to be Moshe is the same thing he's giving you, is humility. That when a person attains the level of Moshe Mashiach, it's because he's attained the highest level of humility to the point that he has no sense of self at all. And when you are like that, then everything you say is true. Because the only thing that's getting in the way of experiencing the light of godliness in your life is called yesh, yourself, your ego. This is the whole reason why the Jewish people had to go through the desert to get to the Torah. Because the Torah is the full revelation of godliness. And it's a hint to the day that Mashiach comes down and reveals Hashem in the world. But we had to go to a desert and go through 49 days in the desert. Why? Because the desert is a place that there's no food and there's no drinks. And all of your comforts have left you. And all of the difficulties in your life have intensified. Why is Hashem doing that? And the answer is because it makes you so humble. Because there's no way for a Jew, for a person, to experience Hashem in their life if they have not attained humility. It never happened. And because Hashem knows you want to be close to Him, and because every day you're praying to be close to Him, then Hashem can only give you that answer by giving you humility because otherwise you're never going to know Him. The tzaddik has attained that highest level of humility and He gives you that highest level of humility not even just through His advice and not even just through His wisdom but simply by the fact that you're listening to Him and that you're following Him 
despite everything to the contrary that says not to do that. Okay. What time is it? Let me see if there's one more question on the bottom here. Not a question, but a very nice comment. Thank you so much. Everybody have an amazing night. Okay. Remember, what's the goal? We have two days until we meet again, Thursday night. Oh, by the way, I missed one. This is very important. Listen to what I said if you haven't left yet. How do you serve the tzaddik? He's not physically here. You're learning Rabbi Nachman's wisdom. Good. Check. We have his advice. Check. But I can't give him my physical possessions. He's not here. Even though we, the, the Gemara says that a person who leaves this world is more influential than when he's here at tzaddik. Okay, so actually Rabbi Nachman can do more for us now that he's not here. This is Gemara, not Kabbalah. Okay, so now with that being said, how do I give him now? How do I give him tzedakah? You do that by spreading his teachings. By allowing others to experience the light of Hashem which can only come through Moshe Mashiach. So if you want to know, besides me giving physical money, which obviously is the hatchila, the tzedakah that he's talking about, what can I do in addition or on the side or instead of if I don't have that money? The answer is get these teachings to everyone. Because when you do that, you are giving tzedakah mamish to the tzaddik. And that itself is going to allow you to rectify your brit which is going to allow you to achieve tefillah that gets answered, and then you're going to experience redemption in your life. Everybody have a great night. Please, if you know any women, tomorrow night is the women's class. Thursday night, Bezrat Hashem is the Lakut Maran class. And if we all pray for it, Bezrat Hashem, hopefully we could see each other next week. Have a good night, guys. Thank you, Rabbi.